Welcome everyone to the latest podcast series of Reimagine Mobility. I'm here with Chris Reed from Nissan. Thanks, Chris, for joining us. Really appreciate it. Maybe to start out, give us a little background of what you're doing at Nissan, what your current role is, and then we'll jump right into it and uh, start the discussion here on how how you see mobility changing and how you see, uh, from your perspective and the corporate perspective, obviously, uh, reimagine the mobility of the future. Great, Stefan. Yeah, this is a great, great chance to have a talk. Well, yeah, just quickly, uh, um, I kind of a mechanical engineer, went to Virginia Tech, came up to Michigan to work for Nissan. And I actually was the first first U.S. engineer to work for Nissan when they decided to kind of transplant the operation into the U.S. And, you know, I think Nissan's been a company where um, been a little bit different, you know, a little more trend center as far as like reaching out in the regions, empowering the regions, and not just having the core control with, with downstream execution, but try to get more upstream in the regions as well. So I got lucky to start on that. And uh, I was remember being a young engineer sitting with like, you know, 15, 20 Japanese engineers at, in, at that time had you know, kind of introductory uh, English capability. And I was just sitting there trying to learn. And it was like they were speaking to Japanese. And I was like trying to stay awake, basically. So, uh, so that was the beginning. And then, but the fun part was, is that all of the people who came to start up the organization were kind of the hot shot top future talent of Nissan. But yet they were young. <laughs> so it was like their first assignment, of course, because it was the beginning of, future, of foreign assignments. And um, later... You know, you didn't know it then, but those guys ended up growing up to be the top of the organization. Um, and so now when I look at the very top of the R, not just R&D, but R&D and business and uh, quality organizations globally, there are people that I've worked with over the years. So I had that kind of fortunate chance, right, to be kind of trained by the, the people that are at the top now. So at least I know the way they think. And I know a lot of their, you know, the, the pros and cons of the way they are as well. But um, so I kind of grew up as an engineer uh, working in body design and I uh, kind of went through my career and I took a little detour for eight years and started a construction company. So that's a different story. But I uh, uh, did that for a while. In 2008, it wasn't a great time to be building houses. So I came back to work for Nissan and I've been better back ever since. So lucky enough to kind of grow through the testing side of the organization, like safety and, cra- and, and restraints and things like that. And then uh, all of the testing areas. And then I went to Japan as a chief engineer for the Murano, got the chance to see the full upstream from the kind of sketch phase all the way to launch, and then come back to the U.S. and follow through the life cycle in our Mes- Mississippi plant and uh, kind of have ownership from the very creation to the very end of the project. So that was a fun experience. And then I got lucky enough to kind of be in the right place at the right time with the right performance and got to to be the head of the organization now in the Americas, um, which we kind of merged over the last few years to take over North and South America from, uh, from here. And of course we're still a satellite of of Japan, but uh, we're kind of executing the the vehicles. And basically what what that means is lost the cars, maintain the life cycle. Um, We're of course we're upstream as much as we can, although we're like one tenth the size of Japan. So for global models, they're going to be kind of platform designed in the, in the Japan and then um, they'll be carried to a certain level, then transferred to the regions. That's for, <clears throat> but of course in the U.S. we're fortunate because deep platform or the bigger cars are going to be the ones that are more region specific. In that case, we we you know we'll, we'll take baseline capacity. You know we have a lot of cars to be managed because we got you know I don't know six seven plants in the North and South America, so we can't do it all. But um, where you know cars like the Titan or the or the Frontier or others where we can actually have ownership from the you know, the sourcing and digital and then, um, you know, physical and launch type phase. So we a little bit of that. And then we do a lot of the other, which is kind of managing the global products as well. So that's kind of how we integrate with the globe. And then what I've been doing to get me to where I am now. What a great story. That's <laughs> it's good. I knew about your construction thing. I think you, uh, when we first met years ago, that's, that's one thing that always stuck with me, which I think is great. So <clears throat> maybe let's, let's jump right in it. And I'm going to I'm going to throw something out and then allow you to either confirm or maybe disagree a little bit. But I believe Nissan oftentimes is not really mentioned when you're talking about EVs, right? Because you guys were, in my opinion, you guys were one of the first ones with the Nissan Leaf. Yet it seems to be conveniently oftentimes forgotten by industry and industry experts. All Everybody's talking about Tesla, obviously. We're talking about Honda and me. I mean, uh, sorry, Toyota, maybe mainly with their uh, with their Prius line, which is really hybrids. 
But I think you guys been at the forefront of, of pushing the future of mobility, trying to reimagine mobility. And I think the leaf has been there uh, all along, so to speak. What is your perspective on that? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, one time I was speaking, actually, I was the chief engineer at Only Regional for the Leaf at some point when it did the minor change. So, we, you know, we lost it as a cute little bug looking car for a while. And uh, that, and that, that, was, that was the beginning, 2010, right? And then it came and we did a refresh. Um, I forgot what year it was, but it was something like, uh, I don't know, 17, 18, something like that. And I was in charge of the execution of that. And so that was one where, as I mentioned, where it was kind of a started in Japan. And then, you know, we've worked out the kinks, got it figured out with the plant, launched it. So I did have a lot of familiarity with the project. At the same time, um, so I had a chance to go up. I think I was up at the uh, auto, the uh, car thing, the automotive research uh, uh, management briefing seminar up north. And uh, I was speaking a bit about the, you know, the future of Nissan and things like that. Uh, in electric space. And I think the same sort of flavor comes up in the conversation. And so at that time, I remember making a statement, and I'm sure that our, our comms people were not so happy with me, but they were like, I was like, you know, we're kind of the wallflower of the EVs, you know, type thing. And um, that probably wasn't the message that I was given, you know, but it was really the, what, what you just said. I mean, it's kind of like everybody knows that. And so like I, I said it as kind of a, in my, my casual speak, speaking way. And then uh, it turns out that got quoted. I, who knew there was media people in the audience? I, I but um, so that was my famous quote. But um, but yeah, I mean, it's kind of interesting. So, I mean, as a pie, you know, to be a, I, I was really proud of Nissan in general to take that plunge because, you know, we're we're very good at, at developing and refining and tuning. And we've been doing cars for 100 years. And it's like the car is always going to be one inch bigger, a half inch shorter to be better, better drag or whatever it is. And a little 25 more horsepower. Right. And then we we have great execution and good quality and and and. And uh, nice, uh, you know, peak perceived quality things. This is great. And then, you know, I'll work on our durability and all the things. But it's like, does that stand out? Well, it does to a degree. And that's why we have, you know, between 6 and 10% market share. Well, then with EVs, this was a breakthrough for the company where we actually decided to go for something as ahead of everyone, not just benchmarking what the others are doing. So this, I'm real proud about that. At the same time, because we didn't, you know, we didn't reckon, you know, of course you, you, you were first. So then you have to take, decide what you want to do. So we decided to go with kind of a, maybe the, uh, the, the niche type people or the people who were like, wanted to do something they weren't sure. So we decided to be different than the rest of the cards. And obviously maybe that, or, and then it's kind of value-based proposition. So I'm always very sensitive now when I talk to my engineering teams or marketability teams or everybody. And they're always like, they're overthinking it from an engineering standpoint. And this would happen on the leaf, I think. It's like, we had data from, you know, from all over the world about how many miles everybody drives per day and the distribution is like less than 70 miles and everybody should be fine and 30 miles is normal and all this other stuff. And then the car, what it had like 90 miles or, you know, range on a, on a like 24 kilowatt, ad, you know, ad, uh, battery. And of course we had to create the supply, supply chain and the manufacturing process and everything that had to be done with it in the entire ecosystem and create a charging network, which at the time when you didn't know about customer acceptance, now, when some companies were throwing billions of dollars into it, we were throwing tens and tens and tens of millions, and it felt like a lot of money, and it was a gamble, and yet, and then we had our own, we had to create the protocol channel. So there was so many headwinds in that thing, proud of the company. But in the end of the day, I think what got us was this kind of trying to be perfectly value-placed. And you know how customers are. They're emotional. They're very emotional. And we know that the design of the car is a part of that. The experience of the car is a part of that. And yet we had a car that was well executed and did what it was supposed to do. And you would, you're, you would be fine, you know, 99% of the time, you're going to be good to go. But then every customer is like, and my wife included, because we got one. And she was like, yeah, but I have to go to Michigan State. And it, what if my daughter needs something? You know, like, so that whole, we know this whole story, right? This rain. It started with that. It didn't have the, uh, the wow's pizzazz factor. Of course, yeah, it was a car that was trying to be reasonably priced and accessible to all. So all those great ideas, which was very like pragmatic. So it was like a pragmatic approach in a breakthrough new market that didn't really uh, didn't didn't um, build momentum and magnify. You know, so so and then you know we took that you know and then of course we're working with the platform. We're 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 trying to decide if the customer acceptance wasn't really there for the second gen, and so we're like, okay, we're gonna we we understand this thing. We're gonna go up to 150 miles of range. That should be th that's kind of within the capacity of the platform that we had. We'll make it look a lot more car-like instead of a little bit unique-like. Um, and then we did that. And so it was like a cute little Sentra car 
Um, and I and it looks good. It's got the, all the styling characteristics of Nissan, V-Motion, and all the good stuff. has a 150-mile range. You almost eliminated the uh, the range anxiety thing. And I think uh, there was two versions, and later there was one at, you know, 200, whatever. And um, and it, and my, even my wife started driving it, and she eliminated the whole range anxiety, and it was great. She loved the car, and we had two of them. Everything was great. Well, again, now you've eliminated the, the range issues, but you've kind of, now you're in the world of, it's just a normal-looking car. And now the people who are in the market who are driving it, and of course, we know what happened with Tesla and all that, is like, we want a sex appeal. We want something that's amazing. I want more power than I would ever need, and I want, I want all these things. So then um, it wasn't that we completely missed that. I mean, we kind of, we just, we decided to kind of, fix the problems, the PDCA, you know, of the things that we had. And we did a good job at that, and it, it built up some momentum. But again, market acceptance, maybe okay. The people that drive it, love it, um, but not widespread, right? Didn't have the volume, never hit the volume it should have hit. So now uh, we lost that momentum in the end of the day, even though it's a good car. Built Smyrna, we manage the battery, we do all that stuff. And um, my wife was incredibly disappointed when I had to turn it in uh, recently, waiting for the next. Now, of course, Ari is, is, is an, a huge uh, a monumental step up. But then I looked at like, the data in the market, right? I mean, you're so right, you know, and um, you could, we ran surveys, you know, like, okay, e high technology recognition, EV leadership, blah, 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 blah. You can get the data out in the market. And it's like Nissan was like number seven or number eight, right, in the e EV especially. Now, in, in Japan, it's like number one, right, because it's like, the customers are a little more um, recognized, and in Nissan is number two, and, and you know they got the top three over there, and so there's recognition of that. And then we're like EV leadership. We have a different kind of a solution for our hybrid, which we call ePower. It's very successful there and all that, all that good stuff. It's funny how we're way above Toyota in that sense. But here, I mean, like you said, Toyota was like number two or three, and when it was asked, like, who's the leader in like EV, you know, because customers are not really sure what exactly EV means. They probably reckon Toyota did a great, the, everybody knows the Prius, you drive it on Uber on the West Coast, all you can find are Priuses. So, so this whole momentum thing that they had kept that thing. So then we have like the recognition there from the dealers, from the customers, from this, we lost that momentum. And of course we were like, hey, we sold a million of these cars, you know, between Aria and, 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 um, and, and Leaf across the world. And so, uh, and a lot of miles and it's successful in Europe and all that. So it's like, we know we have it, the technical capability, you know, we can, we're bragging, of course, or, ha or let's say confident about our, our um, track record on, in the market. We have, you know, whatever, I forget all the numbers, but it's like 6 billion miles traveled or something, and we had no thermal incidents, we've got no issues like that. We created our specs in the beginning, they're probably, they're maybe like overly, incredibly severe because we were trying to make, set the bar high because it's our first time and there was no other work in the industry. So, so that's kind of where we are, and, um, and that, that's what happened, and so now, it's about taking that foundation, which is broad and, and maybe below water <laughs> just a little bit, and then saying, like, what we can do is take all of our grid skills now to, to do better and improvise and meet the customer need and then jump out of the water. And so that's what the RE is the first step on. And now we're working on a whole slew of products, which is kind of our 2030 ambitions. And we've talked about, you know, roughly 40% in the U.S. market for penetration or 50% globally or whatever. And of course, now we know all the regulations are changing that and the IRA is changing that. And everything's going to make that even more challenging and severe for tier four and for uh, cafe and all the things we know as industry that are coming. So the good news is we're, we're, bra we're poised for that knowledge and background. Um, we just kind of can or can accept what the reality is for what happened. And, and then it wasn't like we had made, you know, bad technology and bad quality and that it was just a slight mismatch on the customer need and experience that we know is a lot more emotional than pragmatics. And uh, we just, now we need to, we're recognizing that and we're just kind of poised to gonna accelerate. Cool, cool. You, you mentioned something very interesting, Chris, you're talking about, and you just mentioned at the end, you know, the transformation that the industry is in, right? Regulations, uh, societal pressure, um, um, government intervention, so to speak. IRA would be an example. Europe's working on their own, China does their thing. So we see all these different things. Then now we see the Chinese OEMs really coming on strong and really focusing on infotainment, on, on, on lower cost EVs, pushing heavily into Europe. So there's all these different dimensions of, of private and public intervention or, or guidelines and all this stuff, societal pressure company strategies you just mentioned the 2030 goals you guys have that then suddenly oh we have to maybe change it again we see the same thing within avl right supporting all of the global oems and the large suppliers 
and exactly say the same thing. We see Asia going this way. We see Europe going that way. We see U.S. going this way. As Nissan, all that said, as, as, as Nissan is truly one of the few truly global players, right? Uh, North America, South America, Europe for sure, Asia, obviously. What is the most interesting thing that you see, Chris? And I know you're responsible for, for the Americas, but you have overview, obviously, on, on all the different things that's going on. What is the most interesting few things that you see Nissan is challenged with trying to figure out how to suffice all these different these different or similar directions that the different markets or different regions are going as it relates to reimagining mobility and what you have to do because the customers is is really driving you what what they want with with decisions right no i think um yeah there's i think two points that stand out for me and one is changing the company from a transactional relationship to an experience relationship and i think we've seen other companies that have done are doing a good job at that we we want to be the same and the other is like a a, a change to more regional well, because experience now is becoming transaction to experience, experience is, is a, there's cultural and regional differences. So the customers now are have different requirements because if you think about, you know, obviously we have autonomous, we have EV and connected as our main, you know, main pillars like everybody. And, and um, the connected side obviously is very, you know, very customer, region customer specific. And um, there'll probably be some similarities. And I think some other companies are trying to make more similarity across the globe, but we're seeing a very more of a unique customer need. So that's one of the things. It's customer customer focus because you're going from transaction experience and then that experience needs to be, and then the speed, of course, and that's the thing where when you try to make a global leveling in between a, multiple different brands or, or, or you know arms within the company globally, like your, your speed will never be there. So then because speed is a priority and customer is maybe could be common, but probably regionally unique, it starts. So then we, the speed and customer uniqueness starts to create a tendency towards regional behavior. And then finally, you have the supply chain challenges that we've gone through the last three, four years. And then the thing you just talked about, which is the different regulatory environments. And um, they're kind of converging. I mean, you know, obviously three, four years ago, it, look, it looks like we were diverging on the, in the, the U.S. and now we're getting back on track and now we might even get more severe. So, of course, you know, from any auto company, especially the powertrain planning teams, which are now EV planning teams as well, and but yet ICE is still going to be there. So how do you do both uh, with your with your resources that you have? And then you have incredible uncertainty in the area that used to have the most certainty, right? <laughs> the roadmap for powertrain development and things, you know, NAI, NAIPC that we used to, we've joined together so many times and has really seen that change, you know, five, six years ago, it was all about ICE and this and, and emissions and what have you. And then it was about kind of mobility EV and now it's EV. I mean, so uh, that environment has changed dramatically in five years. And so we've been t I've been talking to our powertrain leadership as well, uh, constantly, obviously. And then, you know, you know that kind of pink-black scenario concept where you have the worst, the best kit, you know, the pink is the good scenario, the black is the bad scenario. In the powertrain community, it's usually the black-black scenario you have to guard for because you can't shift gears very easily. And um, the reality is in today's environment, we have uncertainty. I mean, you know, there's like, oh, here, tier four regulation. Let's eliminate fuel enrichment. Let's do this. Let's have cafe. Let's have GH greenhouse gas. Is it going to change next year with new administration? Oh, my God. You know, like that's not an environment that's very easy, right? And if you pick the blackest scenario every single time, this most severe case, you might miss the entire market if things change. So now we're trying to talk to, and, and then it's like, well, we don't really have the resources to be able to go with like three different proposals paths, you know, for fundamental powertrain development paths um, at the same time. So, you know, that's, I think those challenges all come together then. So regionalization that, that kind of proliferates the powertrain complexity at the same time, regional unique regulatory environment differences. And then the things that are kind of chopping up the globe from a supply chain viewpoint um, are just huge. And then you mesh that with customer uniqueness. It's like the most complex environment you could possibly imagine. And especially if you're the powertrain team, tried to, uh, to paint the scenario and ask how much you know, money you're going to need in the next five years. Clearly, clearly. You, know, you mentioned a very, <clears throat> you used a very interesting word, speed. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a word I quite often use in our organization as well, right? Because to us, I see the industry, not just in the U.S., but globally, right? Different players move at different speeds. But the fundamental common denominator, everybody talks about speed. Everybody talks about it's no longer accepted. It takes three, four years to come out with a new powertrain, with a new platform. It's now 
two years or less, right? In some cases, maybe overly aggressive, in other cases, realistic, doesn't matter. But I think speed, I think we all agree, is the industry is moving faster than it ever has. Probably pushed a little bit by some of the startups that showed us that we can do it, right? Or it's doable. But nevertheless, I think we all agree. Question for you is, what I've noticed over the last three, maybe five years is this, this mindset of technology leadership, as I call it, which is design is, I think, still important. Uh, the feel of a, of a car when you sit is still important. But I feel like I see more and more companies focusing on maybe what the, the newer generation of customers are looking for, which is technology, right? I look at a Tesla. I look at some of the newer vehicles you talked about, right? The Leaf, you said, good feedback on technology. I feel like the technology component on how OEMs like you, and this is where I want your feedback, would like to have your feedback, are focusing on is, is moving more and more to include also technology, not just design, not just quality, not just reliability, but really enticing the buyers with, hey, this is a high compute platform on wheels that is fun to drive, that essentially moves you from the office, from the living room, seamlessly also into the car. So interested to see your perspective on this technology leadership becoming more and more important than a driving force. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it is, and it's a pillar of what we're also talking about, but I also have my, I guess, uh, like not only concerns, but it's just things to, to think about in my mind. And that is, we're seeing transaction prices go up, right? Um, that was a, a supply issues, it's technology, it's raw materials, there's lots of things there. And then the, the industry as a whole. And then we're also seeing the pressure, you know, on um, on the lower end of the market, right? And so we have a lot of great, well, you, you're seeing people leave the lower end of the market, right? And so, so sedans, and it's a, it's a tendency of the, the consumer anyways, that used to be 60% sedans, now it's whatever, 70, 80% truck and SUV and so forth. But- the affordability issue is the only thing I get concerned about because we can make amazing technologies and it's like, you know, we're going to, you know, we're going to have things like LIDAR, we're going to have this and that in the future. I mean, all these great things is going to be amazing for autonomous and hands-free. I, I was out in Silicon Valley this week and then reviewing my team out there as far as um, what we're doing and, you know, obviously driving on the streets and we were doing hand, totally hands-free tours and then you got the, the Googles and the Waymos driving around and the, you know, and the, and the, and the um, things you read about in the news in San Francisco. So, um, which is great. And then you have, uh, then you have this, um, you have the EV side, which we know in the, in the transition before you get to the next generation of batteries, it's going to, it's clearly, I don't know, it's triple the cost of the, of the powertrain or something like that between an engine, ice engine to a battery and a, and a, and a motors and combination. So, um, and then you have the, the technology that we're all striving to be more of, you know, software defined vehicle and, uh, and interactive things, which by itself doesn't cost a lot. It's an architecture issue. Of course, uh, the development teams that are behind that stuff is, is something that we're kind of growing and learning about the size of the teams. Because I think with the in the past, it was more fixed. Like, okay, we decide today, four years later, we're going to have a cross-car line plan for this technology, this, this whatever. We go spend, you know, $100 million on all the teams that make, you know, 300 billion lines of code in the thing. And then we're kind of locked down the wireframe. And it's all there. It's like, oh, let's change it all really quick. And it's like, no, we can't do that. It's like four years to make the thing. So it's like, that's where the speed's eating us up. I think it's conventional automaker, not just the automaker, but the supply base and everybody who's the validation that's needed, you know, this careful, like, you know, we have internal policies about having, you know, kind of perfection in our first production build and you can't have anything that's not off to all process and all these things. And it's like, and yet the others are like doing like a run, fall, run strategy. And we're doing like a crawl, crawl, walk, get ready. And then I think we're good to go. And I think we'll be careful about running. We're going to have knee pads on. So it's like, you know, there's this thing about, that's the speed factor, right? So it's like the commitment to technology, which we want to do, which we're used to doing that on a long-term basis. We need to do it on a fast, agile basis. Of course, and it changes the architecture and changes everything. And then finally, you come back to, you know, for me, it's like, I love Nissan because we're kind of like pushing technology for all. And it's not just a tagline because, you know, like I remember launching our 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 ProPilot Assist uh, t technology, which is now pretty widespread in the market, but we were one of the, you know, one of the early adopters, and we put it on not our high, super expensive Infinity. We put it on the Rogue, right? And why did we do that? Because we wanted to have it accessible to people, and we didn't just put it on the pr super premium Platinum Plus that no one could afford. We put it down the, the line, and we put it on Altima and Rogue, and we had a set, you know. So it's like we our strategy is to develop technology for 
kind of, you know, for all or make it accessible. So then that was our profile assist. And yeah, of course, the market's going very quickly. And we have our RA, which is our profile assist, you know, 2.0. And it's got, you know, hands free, eyes on and all the good stuff. And um, so now we're looking at the next level, the next level, the next level. So obviously we're fired up for more technology. Also thinking about how do you make that accessible for all or at least more accessible to the, the regular models that you have. Yet you're seeing transaction prices going up now. And I'm talking to our sales and marketing experts and they're like, well, people are going to be shifting to just use cars because they won't be able to afford it. So what are we going to do about that? Well, this is the challenge back to us as an industry, right? It's like we need to, uh, we really need to get, you know, this parity concept of powertrain. Well, because that would be nice. It's great to say everybody would like to do that. Um, and then we have customers that are uncertain and it's like 300 miles range and eh, not really really like to have 500 miles range. Okay, great. Make a two times bigger battery. So we need that technology to evolve. And then there's, then there's the tech, the, the software defined vehicle and over there updates. And I know that everybody's making a lot of strides there. So, but anyways, it all comes back to me and the discussions that we're in about, yeah, we're pushing the envelope for these things, but how do you do that and also make it accessible and do it fast and have it up char- updatable? I mean, you know, it's like the, the, the challenges that we didn't have that five years ago, we didn't have any of that. And now we have all of that. Right. Right. I mean, this is something I've noticed over the last 15 years, right? When I first got into telematics and infotainment, that was about 15 years ago. And we already felt there it's a lot of consumer electronics pushing into the vehicle and making it more complex. And now software defined vehicle, which an entire architecture has to change. All your control modules have to change. You may go to now domain controllers, the central compute platforms, and all sounds great, but that's just a tip of the iceberg. What's below, it's what you're saying, costs a lot of money, requires a lot of change. And at the end of the day, it's just becoming more complex, right? Uh, Interesting point you mentioned about your system, putting it into all types of different vehicles, not just the high end. I think this is something, I don't know who pioneered it, but I always remember Ford Sync when they did it, right? The hands-free system they came out with, not just on the high end, putting in the low end. And that really, to me, started this hands-free module or hands-free system pushed by everybody, which everybody then loved. And today, I'm still amazed how many people have their phones in their hands when they're driving around, but more or less every car now has it today, which I think is great. So we have a couple of more minutes left, Chris. I want to ask you one final questions, and please feel also free to, to share some of your own uh, thoughts you had. But what's to you the one defining thing that's got to happen to truly reimagine mobility going forward? Is it the, the truly capable software over the air upgrades, sort of how we're all envisioning it's going to be, but it's not yet? Is it EVs for everyone? Again, it's not just the average sales price is 60000 but Exactly as you said, comes down to the whatever thirty, thirty-five, maybe forty thousand. What is one of the things that you feel like needs to happen for us to really use this technology that we have today, but putting into products to now make reimagine mobility a reality? Yeah, I think I think there's probably a there's there's got to be a collaboration element there that um, that the way that even Nissan's traditional relationship with our supply base um, probably needs to change. And that this is the speed factor. There's a, there's a trust factor, speed communication, there's that. But it's also just about how to be nimble, where it's like, here's a design, you quote this, you make you make it very clear. We got 55 pages of very clear requirements and all this other stuff. And then it like, then to change it, we're ner- on the OE side, we're nervous. It's like, well, you're just going to wait for change orders and, and, you know, whatever, you know. And so that's kind of old school, right? And so how are we going to be nimble and, and make a half the development time, which means we're going to have more problems we're going to have to solve at the last minute and, and be nimble to make this great experience for the customer without making costs go crazy. So, yeah, it's like that's what I think about anyways. It's like we need to think about think differently. I mean, we're not going to be able to just say, okay, everybody take half the time out of what they used to do, this kind of in-series process. And, yeah, there's a lot of parallel paths that we always have had in, in, in manufacturing and Montezacuri and buildability and all those things. And then, but it, the, I think the relationship with the supply base is about a little bit, a little more in series, or at least it's kind of like you do it, you do, we'll do it, we'll do it, we do. And I think it's, uh, it's something we should have to think about because in the end of the day, um, you know, we know that there's going to be a transition of, of uh, ice in the market. Um, you know, you, isn't the person you talk to, a friend probably that's just like, you know, that you'll find half your people that are like, I, I don't really, you know, they don't really buy into the EV concepts. And and so it's experience-based. 
that you know we know as an industry we're going to solve these problems right we're going to get to the right amount of range we're not going to have range anxiety we're going to have infrastructure that's that's growing by in leaps and bounds and eventually the speed of charge will be you know we're going to solve these problems as an industry but the transition is the hard one when you bet too much on one thing and customer acceptance again this is the this is the, the 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 trump card that we all have to work with because like we said we had a product that as if you have, if you took the time to evaluate it and love it with the leaf and use it and realize that it was functional and it works and it wasn't too, it was a Goldilocks, I guess. So I'm changing it from wildflower to Goldilocks, just the right range, just the right cost, just the right everything, just the right experience. It was spot on. Now, how do you get everybody the same feeling like that? And so now as we go to all these new things, we're going to invest all this time and money, effort in the right EV balance, the right amount of connected, the right amount of autonomous. And then, um, and yet, you know, you can hear articles that are kind of exaggerated and all this stuff like, oh, autonomous is moving way too fast and putting traffic cones on cars in San Francisco. And it's like, yet that is moving very fast as well. I mean, that's not, they, that's going to keep going. And it's got to be the comfort level changes because customers kind of look rearward. They're not sure when they want to look forward. There's always going to be the, the front of the curve for people who are early adopters. Yeah, that's fine. But that's not the main market. That doesn't support us as a you know, supplier OE relationship to invest you know, all of our future money into this direction. And so it's just a balancing act between the two of us. So I think this collaboration between us is the, the things that will make us successful. We're going to have to gamble on some of the customer acceptance and, um, and, and work together to kind of educate and teach and to get experience, experience based stuff. So I think that hasn't been the past. I mean, who likes to go to the, the, the dealership and take a test drive? No, it's like, we're used to just picking and going. And so, uh, we're going to have to kind of work together to solve those problems. And I, I guess to be successful and um, you know, I know it's going to work. And I know we're going to solve these problems, but we got to pick the right gambles. So we all have enough money to get to the end of the rainbow. Uh, Kip, you picked the right gambles and you picked the right team members. And again, change that supplier customer relationship that you uh, talked about, which I completely agree. I think this is, this is something that we've been dealing with for 20 plus years. And we always talk about, but I think now at this point, we need to do it because we see how many OEMs and suppliers collaborate, right? How many we collaborate with as, as AVL. You have your partner you collaborate with. If I go back 10, 15 years, collaboration was like, no, unless I absolutely have to. Today, it becomes much more standard because I think it's a need as well. And I think this is where, where you're hinting at. I think it's very, very accurate. Thank you very much, Chris, for your time. And, uh, Thank you very much for tuning in and helping us uh, reimagine mobility together. All right. Love the podcast. You guys put a lot of energy into it. So congrats to get the good visibility and conversation going. Have a great day. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Reimagine Mobility Podcast. If you like this episode, please subscribe and tell a friend.